Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am your IKG coordinator and presenter, Sister Ajwa, and we are so thankful that you have joined us this evening. As always, we would like to know who all is in the house with us this evening. So please, in the chat, let us know where you're checking in from, what city, state, country are you viewing us? from. Also, as we get through the evening, just want to let you know this is a webinar, so your cameras and audio are automatically muted. We do ask that you engage with the presentation via the chat and that you place any questions that you may have for our presenter in the Q&A box. For those of you all who may be new, IKG Cultural Resource Center is an organization based here in Washington, D.C., and we host various different programs, and our monthly program is the Wisdom Wednesday free lecture series that has been being held via Zoom now for the, almost, for the past almost three years. And IKG Wisdom Wednesday is an opportunity for various scholars, speakers to present on topics relevant to the Black community and the Black experience, and to provide information that can help enrich our lives, the lives of our family, the lives of our community, and of course, our people. So tonight, we are very pleased um, that you are here to join us. Before we get started, we do want to acknowledge uh, to some of the cities to see how to see the span of our family. So we have folks checking in from California, Maryland, DC, of course, at ATL. We have Addis Ababa in the house. Okay, Africa, check it out. Um, let's see, Maryland, DC, Delaware, New York City, San Diego, uh, LA again, Montana. We have California, we have Trinidad in the house, Newark, New Jersey, Chicago, tell some calling these cities out, uh, Florida. Thank you for joining us, Boston. Thank you for joining us, California, Newport Beach, California. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you again, um, Fort Myers, Florida, Mississippi in the house, Jackson, Mississippi at that. All right, wonderful. Thank you all again for being a part of tonight's presentation. Tonight, we are pleased to bring to you Dr. Niana Racion who will be speaking on AI, the cyber theft of cultural identity and human value. Dr. Racion writes that in his presentation, he will examine the biases of software designers who receive the most resources to develop programming designed to exploit, marginalize, and engage neuromarketing strategies to undermine human thinking. Tonight, he will examine the use of algorithms that insidiously replace one's entry objective along paths that redirects focus and alters brain chemistry. Special attention will be given to AI algorithms that are employed as digital traffic cops to realign your initial quest by discreetly eroding cultural identity endorsement and sense of self-worth. Explanations will be shared to illustrate how softly to moderately distracting cyber highways are particularly difficult to avoid or escape. In addition, how your attention is being stolen and captured in spiral mazes filled with visual and audio vignettes that mimic places, sites where you have spent time. The rationale for the design, danger, and acceptance will be addressed. Dr. Niana Racion is a behavior neuroscientist and professor. He received his master's degree at Fisk University and Meharry Medical College Joint Program in Clinical Psychology. He earned a doctoral degree in psychobiology, neuropsychology at Howard University. His current research interests are, are chronic concussion syndromes, neuroplasticity, 
micronutrients and mental health conditions, brain fog post COVID SARS virus, as well as a secondary tier of interest, which include undiagnosed PTSD, akin to learned helplessness, racism, domestic terrorism, and the influence of ancient history on perceptions of death. He has authored two books that build on social neuroscience, Reality Check, A Manual for the Human Octahedron and the Mystery of Melanin, and The Awakening, OMG, The President is Black. Niana will be completing his third book on ancient perspectives on crossing over during the summer of 2023. In addition, he is on the editorial board of the Journal of Mental Health and Social Behavior and a board certified fellow and diplomat in African-centered Black psychology. His collective work experiences focus on clinical interventions and how to navigate the system of white supremacy. I'm now going to ask Dr. Racion to come on. And please join me in welcoming our esteemed speaker for this evening. Thank you, Baba. Hotep, Hotep, do I have decent audio? Yes, you do. We can the hear you and see you well. The first thing I like to say is anyone in the crowd, anyone in the family over the age of 65, I'd like to ask you humbly, would you please give me permission to continue speaking? Yes, sir, you may speak, my brother. Thank you, Baba. I'm honored. Um, a number of people may not be aware that what we always have to do is before we open our mouth, because to speak is a gift from the ancestors. And the reality is, is before you open your mouth, you need to get permission from those who are wiser than you, who have traveled and walked more roads than you before you say a word. So whenever I'm allowed to, I think I perhaps should start sharing my screen. Is it okay to do that now? Um, yes, it is. Okay, yeah. so I, I need to get your permission because it won't, won't let me do it until you say it's okay. Okay, let's, um, we'll get that squared away for you. And I would like to encourage the family, the people proximal to DC and throughout the planet, those of you, as the sister just shared with you, if you have a comment or something that you'd like to input at this point, I think we're inviting the chat. And I want you to know that I am absolutely open to those individuals that may perceive themselves as being wedded to computer technology, because this is the last marriage of the human brain with mechanical material. And at this point, it's literally in the arena of, let me see what just happened. I see you on the screen. I want to get my screen back up. Yes, you should be able to share. Oh, I'm sure I can share. I want to get my um, my my presentation to populate. A little while ago, I literally saw it, but now I'm looking at you. Give me a second here. I have to collapse your screen. Now we just shared it a second ago. I'm trying to figure out where did it go. When you click share, you should see an icon that has that particular document for you to I'm, click on. Yeah, I'm about to pop it, pop it there now. I just wanted to make sure that I had the one that had already opened up for you. Pardon the glitch.
me collapse your screen. I'm unsure where it went. So one, one second. I'll use this one. It's populating. Okay, we should have a visual on the screen now, do we not? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Again, I apologize for the technology, but I want you to know that the um, First Nation people who are our siblings, oftentimes referred to as Native American, First Nation people, they actually were the Africans that were living here and the climate sort of changed them and gave them a ruddy or red hue. And I mention that because I'm on First Nations people land now out in what I call the Algonquin Court. It's on a part that flanks the District of Columbia that people oftentimes refer to as, they call, I don't like to say it, so I'll just quote the terminology. I'll spell it because I don't even want to evoke the language. Um, this area is referred to as I-N-D-I-A-N, I-N-D-I-A-N, head. This is how they refer to it. And I wanna acknowledge that this is Algonquin territory. I point that out because I'm on their land now. Now, as you see, it's nothing that we can do in this arena without acknowledging the brilliance of the humble brother who is a spiritual warrior, a comedic genius, and we happen to have an Egyptologist always among our midst, and he's the reason why we have the Institute of Karmic Guidance and Wisdom Wednesday. So I want to always give a shout out to Tony for making things like this possible, Ajua and his daughter Atlantis. So we're going to talk about this evening is AI, the cyber theft of cultural identity and human value. And the reason why we need to talk about it is because it's absolutely taking place. You'll also note that you see in the background, you will see a web because most Africans are aware that the internet is referred to as the web, but we know it as Anansi's web. The internet is filled with tricks. It's filled with an labyrinth of mazes that makes it very difficult for you to move from one point to the next point. And having said that, we're gonna move into our subject matter. You can see AI, the cyber theft of cultural identity. I want you to take a note where you see algorithm overload to the left. I wanna be very clear about this. And if anyone doesn't have a visual, I'm sure someone can let me know that the visuals have been compromised. But let's be very clear. You can see this is sort of like the old classic movie, The Matrix, but you can also see zeros and ones representing code, the code in the background that's always running through your psyche in manners that you oftentimes are unable to recognize. But let me give you a spiritual piece of information about those zeros and ones in code. Those ones represent masculine energy and those zeros represent feminine energy. And you can do anything in the universe when you combine the yin and the yang, or when you combine negativity and positivity or electrotism and magnetism combined. This is how you're able to communicate and convey things in cyberspace and without an actual connection via a digital network, which means like you may have fiber optics, we can do things with Bluetooth. So as you see Anansi's web, at the very bottom, you see me referencing Anansi's cul-de-sacs in cyberspace. And if you guys are familiar with a cul-de-sac, a cul-de-sac is when you get in that little circle and you have to turn around. But the unique thing about the internet and about going into cyberspace and how algorithms work is that those traffic cops Will make it difficult for you to turn around and i'll expand on that momentarily on your left of your screen you'll see a bunch of hypodermics inside of a glove i'm going to peekaboo touch on that also momentarily but you see these individuals holding a disc and that red little disc absolutely represents the hidden computer chip that they use to navigate everything that you think you have control over and those things are being monitored by something we call meta tagging and meta tagging is the computer collects data your phone collects data of wherever you've been, how much time you spent there, and particularly what you spent specific time attending to on a particular site. Also the visuals that you spent time on, on that site. Above those individuals, you see them with a brain at the top. And that brain absolutely is gold because nothing in the human body does not, will not work if you don't have melanin. And what allows the brain to work is neuromelanin. That's a special class of melanin. But you see these individuals around the brain inside this person's head. 
This is what we oftentimes refer to when we're online. When we say, my God, those things have gone viral. And what we may not realize is when something has gone viral, that means that we have become infected. The fact that we've actually noticed it and given it the power of giving it a term to go with it, we say it's gone viral. And when something goes viral, we oftentimes don't even use the numbers. We'll just say it's gone viral. And people will find themselves on that bandwagon. Hence, you see those individuals around that brain and you see written above it something that I'm referring to as algorithm overload. Now, navigating those traffic cops and algorithms online is a serious problem. So let's move on and we're going to dance with this. Introducing AI, artificial intelligence. I literally chose a vanilla brother to highlight this for you. And even though the genius is behind everything that we relate to on the internet, I don't have a slide to show him to you, but it's a brilliant brother, an Indian brother who actually invented the internet and his name is V.A. Shiva, all right? He's a genius. He has at least four master's degrees from MIT and his last name is Shiva. He's the brother that invented the internet. But in Washington, D.C., this brother would basically be identified as a brown brother and unfortunately, due to the language and the conditioning of a lot of brown and black people, they would probably refer to him as having good hair because his hair is kind of straight, like you would find the Aborigines, some of them, and some of the people in the Polynesian Islands. But I want to be clear. The actual internet that allows you to actually use email, I want to be concrete about it, is directly attributed to him. I don't want to say literally the entire internet because her sister had her hands in that equation. But with regard to the internet, it's Brother Shiva. Now, what is AI? AI, I want you to tune into this. AI is intelligence orchestrated by writing code designed to perceive, synthesize, infer, and execute actions. AI research has been defined as the field of study of intelligent agents, which refers to any system that encodes environmental stimuli to foster approximations of archived data clusters subject to being shuttled on predetermined routes guided by algorithms to foster high percentage behavior outcomes. Now, what does that mean in a nutshell? Select derivations of humans are no longer needed. I don't see it on my screen, so you probably can't see it either. But at the bottom of the screen, the word is repeated obsolescence, 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 because there are derivations of humans that are no longer valued as being very important. And as a result of those individuals no longer being valued as very important, we have decided that those individuals ex are literally expendable. And one of the sophisticated and insidious ways to do that is to lock a number of them up in cyberspace and then lock a number of them up in structured spaces that we call the industrial prison complex. And then we also lock up a number of those individuals in these cubicle school rooms where we have people that are ill-equipped to guide them, facilitate their learning slash teach them because the Eurocentric model of education in America literally undermines, degrades the ability of melanin dominant people to encode and process the information in those environments. So again, let's be clear. They have you captured in cyberspace. They have you captured in structured facilities. And then they have you literally commandeered and controlled in environments where you're supposed to be educated, which is supposed to be designed to liberate the mind and liberate the tongue. And I do not need to tell you, when I was in school, we actually had something called recess. I visited a couple of schools and I found youngsters actually responding to bells and horns like Pavlov's dog. They had maybe 20 minutes for their lunch. They were not allowed to jump up and run around and have fun. Some people told me they needed to be quiet while they ate their food and then it would be shuttled back to that environment to get that linear track model of learning. So when you see this code that's basically superimposed on the backside of the brain of this European male or this phenotypic Caucasian male, I want you to know that the lens of education in America, in spite the number of people that are always talking about that they utilize an Afrocentric approach, the reality is the vast majority of them have been trained through a Eurocentric paradigm. And what a number of them have done is they take Afrocentric knowledge and they code it and tag it with a Eurocentric training. And as a result of that, it translates into a disconnect. And that disconnect translates into us having an allegiance to do a number of things that are Eurocentric, though we may claim that they're Afrocentric, but the reality is our deliverables become Eurocentric. 
when you are not creating the algorithms, what happens when you are not creating the algorithms? That's critical because when you are not creating the algorithms, someone else is writing the algorithms for you. And algorithms revolve around a number of things that I'm gonna expand on momentarily, but they are very structured guidelines. Think of an algorithm as being like a recipe and think of a recipe as only being able to be utilized if you have the ingredients. Now remember, if you have a recipe and you have ingredients that comes from a Eurocentric database, and if you have ingredients that have been archived in a Eurocentric database, then when those algorithms are rewritten and they build on themselves for AI because they collect the data and they learn, they're gonna pull up data that's already been archived that completely, totally misrepresents you. And as a result of that, during that misrepresentation process, you're gonna find yourself struggling trying to make that information that in reality is technically irrelevant, but you're gonna find yourself doing those classic stereotypical things that you hear a lot of brown and black people saying when they're doing a number of things, they'll say, well, just answer it like you think um, those people that identify themselves as white do. They say, answer it that way. They say, answer it that way. And, and answering that way, it, I don't know who's calling me, so my phone shouldn't even be on, I apologize. I thought it was on silence. And, and people say this religiously, and I'm going to be colloquial. I don't like to use this language because I refer to Caucasians as vanilla brothers and siblings and or melanin recessive humans. I refer to them as vanilla brothers and sisters and or refer to them as melanin recessive humans. But my vanilla brothers and sisters oftentimes will operate out of what they've been trained to do. But when you find African-Americans doing things in order for them to be successful, you hear it all the time, quote, Answer it the way you think somebody white would answer it. Or if you really want to do well in this environment, you're on the telephone, just try to like explain it the way you think someone white would explain it. And we do know these so-called white, because those individuals that identify as white, they're basically melanin recessive humans. And I'll leave it at that until I move to another level to expand on it. Your brain processes everything everything around you, things that actually that you are not able to register under the raw GB of spectrum, all right? Red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, and violet. Think of the visible spectrum as being a slice of bread, okay? And the visible spectrum is a slice of bread and the loaf of bread. But what I want you to understand is there are a number of nuances of color and energy that people that are melanin dominant can pick up and process. We refer to it as vibing. Vanilla people, when they're trying to approach it, in general, they'll say there is a certain chemistry. But brown people, black people, wherever you find people of color out the world, they will tell you they're picking up these vibes. Uh, a lower vibration of those vibes in general will be your general intuitions. But when your vibrations are up high enough, your pineal gland actually chimes in and it's located about back here, and it has a direct line of energy that feeds from something in your brain called optic chiasma, and it processes radiant energy, and it does an incredible unique set of dances when the sun has set that you refer to as dreaming. And because Europeans have only tapped into processing one of those neurotransmitters or compounds, which technically is a neurotransmitter and also a neurohormone, it's called melatonin, but that's because that's the one that they're studying the one that they can control and sell and market. But there are a cascade of compounds that dance around in your head when you are dreaming because the pineal gland is always online and it is your literally, can be literally identified as your Bluetooth. And you don't need the internet to engage Bluetooth. So where are we with this issue around processing information and dealing with the brain being hijacked and the algorithms that they put in our face on a regular basis that we cannot bypass. I want you to know that this particular part of the brain that you see highlighted here, green, this little part here, actually is juxtaposed on another part of the brain called the hippocampus, which isn't highlighted here, but they are married to each other in terms of proximity. The hippocampus, prior to us having what we refer to today as GPS, the London cabbies had to memorize those turns and those streets in the UK because we didn't have GPS in those days. And the sister name escapes me now that actually invented GPS. 
But I'm mentioning this to you is because your amygdala is the part of the brain that we think about when we think about a person having a surge of emotional energy that they don't exactly know what to do with. And when they have that surge of emotional energy that they don't know what to do with, they have a tendency to become kind of reactive. The stereotype would be fight or flight because they have a surge of energy. What we've learned to do in cyberspace, we've learned to hijack the amygdala. We do it on a regular basis with movies. I'm gonna give you a simple example so you can process the symbolism. Have you ever noticed when you visit the cinema, you may see brown and black people at the cinema and oftentimes when you see those brown and black people at the cinema, typically what can actually occur is you see those individuals periodically immersing themselves so much into the movie that they are wrapped up into the movie to the degree that the level of immersion is referred to as absorption. I'll give you a simple example. You hear black people say things like this and brown people say things like this. You see a movie and it's a very threatening or a situation where someone is in imminent danger. And brown and black people actually start talking to the damn movie. They'll say things like, don't go in there. I told you not to go. And they will start grimacing and generating body language as if they're in the movie. Now that's what happens in the movie with cinematography. Something more insidiously occurs when you're online. When you're online, have you ever noticed that if you open up your cell phone or if you open up your computer and you go online and you look at a number of things, and once you looked at those things at that particular website, then you can open up your phone or your computer and then you're saturated with a lot of advertisements directly related to that. But you may not know those advertisements are loaded to be directly related to how much time you spent there. And they will send you a series of those advertisements and you will be in that network of that matrix. Those are those algorithm traffic cops that I was alluding to. It's difficult to get away from those things. If you click the wrong place and that symbolism or that graphic, it'll take you deeper into that wormhole. And if you click the place to try to get out of it, sometimes it will cloud or obstruct what you're trying to read. So there are several steps. It's like getting on a superhighway feedback loop, and it's difficult to get out of those things. But what that does is it overly activates the amygdala because it creates a surge of emotional uh, valence, whereas you just like you want to get out of there. But as soon as your emotions reach a peak, then another one of those advertisements may come up where you spent more time. And wherever you spent more time, that advertisement could populate. And when it pops up, you may find yourself noticing it. And when you find yourself noticing it, you don't realize, but this part of your brain, the frontal lobe, has just been hijacked by the amygdala and memories. And when they hijack it, you fixate on encoding that information. And this entire limbic cluster in your brain, the thalamus, the thalamus is sort of like your um, metro center in Washington, D.C., or the hub wherever the trains connect and whatever the city you're in. And all the information is funneled through that particular environment. But note, that, that environment is a very busy environment. And the busier that environment is, the more you're going to see little advertisements popping up that you perhaps spent some time on to capture and hold your attention. And this is why we refer to it as having your amygdala being hijacked. And by the way, when it gets hijacked, what happens in the frontal lobe becomes significantly diminished. That's the part of the brain that allows you to make decisions, you know, figure out exactly what you want to do, how much time you have. And also, if you see this little blue area here, I hope you guys can see my cursor and maybe Ajwa can let me know if she can see the cursor. I'm moving the cursor around this little blue area here. The name isn't here for you, but this little blue area where I'm moving my cursor is beneath this letter P and replacing thought, replacing just beneath that where you see that blue. That's a little unique part of the brain called the cingulate gyrus. That particular part of the brain is intimately involved and when you're getting pleasure, uh, strong turnover of dopamine, sometimes oxytocin kicks in, the feel good hormones. Like when kids play video games, they fixate, they're not able to stop. And when some humans that are immersed into watching other people's flesh and porno, that particular part of the brain becomes completely immersed into that. And it's difficult to get out of that feedback loop. We're not able to see the cursor, Bob. Oh, you can't? Okay, well, just think under the P where you see this little blue, it's the word replacing, the little blue area in the brain. I'm sure you can see that. That particular area from the P up forward, that relates to the area that I just mentioned called the cingulate gyrus. And it really engages when people are dealing with a lot of pleasure. 
Thank you for giving a heads up. Now, I want you to know what they have mastered with algorithms. And notice that this person is in a hoodie, but you don't see the face, okay? And the reason why you don't see the face is because spiders never let you know when they're coming, but they know where you are on the web. And this is why I made a reference earlier referring to the internet. And you guys call it the web. Everybody calls it the web. They call it the World Wide Web, all right? But I usually refer to it as a Nazi's web because one of the most visited places online to get information oftentimes is one of the places where the information needs to be cross-referenced at least three times in order for you to confirm that it's accurate. Now, you pay close attention to what I'm about to share with you. This particular place online where people will find themselves there by default when they put certain things in a search engine is called Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a place where you can get a lot of information, but you need to cross-reference the information. But what you are doing when you're going online is you drop something in the search engine and you're trying to find information. Millennia ago, that's thousands of years ago, ancient civilizations relied on what we call oracles. And if you were to go online, you would find something called oracle relating to computers and software. But oracles, I've highlighted some of the classic ones for you, and I'm going to end with the last one that most people have a variety to choose from all of which at the very bottom are driven by algorithms. I'm sure most of you have heard of Ife. Some people call it Ife, all right? You know, when you're doing the cowrie shells, to basically tap into your ancestral knowledge of the Akashak records, where you can get specific information. Some of you have heard of the Iking, all right? The brothers that would use the Yari sticks or toss the coins, an ancient Kush connected to what we now refer to as China, that particular part of the world, those individuals, they would rely on another oracle, and their oracle was designed to give you information that you could tap into the archives that belong to the universe. And I'm sure a number of brown and black people are familiar with the tarot, another oracle that people use to tap into information. But people have been socialized in America to be afraid of these things because they were told that those kinds of things related to something that was nefarious and something negative or something that was related to something evil. But all those things, the old ancient oracles that allowed you to tap into information that you could access easily if you knew how to use that spiritual technology. And some of you've heard of ruins, all right? Should be R U, should be an N in there, an E in there. And I know you're familiar with astrology, okay? Which is basically the application of astronomy for people. And then there are readers, people that you visit. And if you visit the Polynesian Islands or Hawaii, you encounter the kahunas. I'm staying away from the word shaman because it has some connotations that I'd rather not bring up now. And of course, your companions, they claim they can read you. And that's one of the things that allows people to bond with other people when you have resonance. When you have resonance with someone, your chakras in your body have reached a level of alignment. And when those chakras reach that level of alignment, you feel connected to those people. And that's what we refer to when we have a bond with those people. We say we have companions and we appreciate their companionship. But here is the real challenge, the one at the very bottom. And because you can't see my cursor, it's the last yellow letters at the bottom of the screen on the left where you see software apps. Software apps have unfortunately replaced and undermined people's respect for cultural alliance and cultural identity. You can visit any major environment and you will find young people in particular and some older people. They could be in the same environment. They could be within seven to 10 meters of each other. But what will they do? Let me look at my app to see who's in here. And then you put something in your app and your app will basically identify whatever those things were that you highlighted in your app and someone else that can relate to it. You may find yourself texting that individual. And you may find yourself sharing emojis with that person before you actually go over and feel that person's vibe. And when you feel that person's vibe, you can get a lot more information from that person than you can from that app. But the challenge is, when you don't have a sense of your cultural identity, you will allow the internet to tell you how you should present yourself. And in a couple of moments, I think I'm gonna have a slide that I can share with you to point out to you how we allow the internet to define us. I'm sure some of you have your own personal avatar in your phone. And that personal avatar, like I've seen some people that have more melanin than me, okay? 
and I will look at their avatar, and their avatar looked like it's caramel to like damn near translucent. And I'm like, oh, so I know you personally. And you have an avatar that basically has a phenotype of one of your hybrid siblings or those melanin recessive brothers and sisters, and it doesn't look like you. The hair doesn't look like your hair. The physiognomy, the facial features don't look like you. You look like something other than yourself. So that's telling me that you have basically allowed your identity to be commandeered by the software and you've begun to overly identify with what you think people will appreciate as a representation or a bit moji of what you should look like. And that's old school classic dangerous. You see them at work. And you can see this person, if you know anything about cinematography, they will use a blue screen or a green screen. And oftentimes the people that are doing a number of things in those movies and cinematography, you may think that that person is doing those things, but they've created a blue screen or a green screen in the background. And that person is either in a suit and all those things that they want to do, they pencil in with animation. And when they do that, your eyes are being tricked and your brain is, for example, Let's take the Vanilla Brother, Tom Cruise. Anyone that knows anything about Top Gun, they know that the Top Gun or the Top Gun pilots were individuals that were part of the Tuskegee Airmen, the Red Tails, the Black Brothers. They were Tuskegee Airmen. But even this last Top Gun that they made, they have you looking at, quote unquote, vanilla males doing all types of aerial phenomena that none of them did. And the reason why they don't make it clear to you that those individuals that were Top Gun were black is because the archives, the database would have to reference these people. And when you look at those people in their database, you're going to be inclined to think, if you put Top Gun in, the movies are gonna come up. It's because the computer algorithm is gonna pull up the movies and it's gonna pull them up based upon what? The hit rate or the frequency of people looking at those things. And so the Tuskegee Airmen will basically be pushed into oblivion. So when someone actually hits you with the truth, the truth is going to sound like fantasy because you've been in that loop and those algorithms looping over and over again, that nonsense, and you've heard it before. If you hear a lie long enough, people will begin to spout and repeat that lie like it's the truth. And as you can see also on the screen where this individual is at work, you can see United States of America. But what you don't see, but you will see if you look closely at any of American currency, after they tell you it's legal tender for all debts, public and private, you will see in God we trust. And that will remind you that these people are object driven. They focus on embracing the object. And the object is something that can always be counted and measured to pull on the data and the knowledge from my colleague, Dr. Edwin Nichols, who makes that very clear about the value system that Europeans oftentimes use and we buy into. For example, you can look and you see a Nazi's web in the background again. You see these cobwebs, these spider webs. And when you get caught in the web, you're in the web until either the spider decides to consume you in a wormhole until you happen chance wind up escaping that loop and you get out. But by then you're probably a little exhausted. Something else that you may not know. Computer screens, it doesn't matter if it's the sophisticated, whisper thin flat screens or the curved screens, it doesn't matter at all. The light from the computer screen is a special quality of luminescence. And your eyes will literally follow what you see happening on the screen when it's animated. Years ago in Japan, they forbade a, different, a number of videos from being shown because they realized kids were having seizures because the way the light would flicker on and off. And when they first came out with Wii, people were screwing up their computer screens. And so they had to make it so they could lock down the remote because they would be so immersed into the game that they were cast the remote and it will actually break the screen. Back to me telling you about brown and black people in the cinema, you become immersed in the movies. There's a classic Socratic axiom called know thyself. Um, Tony used to bring it to people's attention on a regular basis when he would be in commit, telling people of what you would see at the Pantheon and the entrance to, to major sacred places in Egypt you would see know thyself. But I want you to know in the red letters, also in the cobweb and the spider webs, I've embedded for you thyself no more. Thyself no more. We are here. 
And artificial intelligence is literally what it states itself to be. It's artificial intelligence, which means it's disconnected from humans, but it collects all the data about what humans do and it collates that data and aligns that data to duplicate or mimic things that humans could do, but it can oftentimes do it at a swifter rate because it's turning over so much data at phenomenal speeds depending upon your server and depending upon what kind of network you attach to and what kind of technology you're utilizing to engage the internet. So know thyself, you find yourself lost in cyberspace. I bet you if you were to interview people and you would find out most of us and sporadically I find myself challenged with the same thing, unable to remember at least seven to 10 telephone numbers in my phone because I have a person's name attached to the number. And if you were to find a person, he or she's lost their phone, colloquially speaking, they will be tripping because they need their phone. They get up in the morning, they check the phone before they make salat, a prayer. They check their phone before they cleanse themselves. They look at their phone before they fall asleep. Some people fall asleep with their phone. And that's the worst thing in the world you could do if you have a damn phone and you fall asleep with it in your bed, particularly around your head, your upper torso, and your lower body. You don't want to do that. Now, this is dangerous. This is in classic Japan and, and you find it. Now, can you tell from looking at this lady's expression on her face? Now, what you may not know is she's working very hard because you see all the things that she's carrying, but these little droids are walking around serving food. Now, you could interpret this to basically surmise, maybe she's cleaning up and picking up after the people have eaten. You don't really know, but that's what it looks like, or she's delivering things. But these droids, they are serving. You will all say, so see embedded beneath the helmet something like a smile. And by the way, if you didn't know it, these particular units can be programmed to speak with different voice tonal qualities. They can be programmed to speak a variety of languages, but they're literally programmed to bring to your table based upon where you are seated exactly what you ask for and a number of them, which means what? That the humans are replaceable. I want to plant in your head, um, this is a well-known algorithm cluster. It's called Python. And if you know it, they named it Python, which means it's very powerful. You know about Python, the snake, they coil around you, they take the air out of you and those types of things. But there are different types of algorithms. But Python is the classic one that sort of represents the epitome of the ones that we have in place now. So I want to summarize for you how sophisticated an algorithm is, all right? Any other language are most commonly written in step-by-step -step manner that clearly defines the instructions a program needs to run. Remember when I made a reference earlier telling you that an algorithm is like a recipe? But then I commented and mentioned to you that, hey, but you can only make what you have the ingredients to actually bring that recipe to fruition. Now, though, though there is no defined standard as to how you should write an algorithm, listen to that very carefully. There is no defined standard as to how you should write algorithms. There are basic shared code constructs between languages that we often use to create an algorithm, such as loops, like I told you a little while ago. You can get on a loop, and that loop is repeating the code to keep you there. Because once you're saturated with the loop, and then it could control the flow that it's letting you out, those are the traffic cops. Let's say an algorithm is designed to keep you in the loop for at least eight to seven cycles. Are you guys aware that almost every group of people on the, every human derivation on the planet, they do something that we refer to as praying. And those prayers are oftentimes repeated under the rubric of a term that we call mantras. If someone were to repeat your name to you over and over again, depending upon the tone that they use, the timbre that they use, all right, they would get your attention at two levels. One, they will either irritate you, which means they're gonna deal with your emotions, or two, they could pull you in closer to them. Humans are known for this for some reason. When humans are sharing intimacies, 
Humans seem to get possessed when they hear their name called. As a matter of fact, there's all manner of lyric being written about, hey, say my name, say my name, say my name, say my name. And of course, people of color would tell you that you can throw their whole day off if you evoke a resonance in their name attached to something that they refer to as calling them out of their name. And if you blaspheme their mother or their deity, you can also turn up the volume in the amygdala. You can get an emotional surge. And so when you can get an emotional surge, I should show you a slide. The word emote means to move ions randomly, okay? Emote, E-M-O-T, all right? Or E-M-O-T-E, -E, and ion, I-O-N, which means when I get you to emote, I can change what's happening inside of your body with emotions. And that's where neuromarketing is gonna come in momentarily, and I'm pretty sure I have a slide for it. By the way, before I speak to that, I want you to know about the beliefs. What you believe, and remember when I said something goes viral? If something goes viral, people are like, wow, everybody is doing it. Like I used to watch these dumb people online eat what they call scorpion peppers, all right? And they would eat this, I mean, the scorpion peppers are incredibly hot. And then you would see people put like a teaspoon of cinnamon in their mouth and they would start tripping. But the reality is they are mimicking and doing what they see other people doing because those things have gone viral. And as you can see in this slide, there's a big word at the top beneath the placebo effect called psychoneuroimmunology. Stevie Wonder talked about this a long time ago. It had to be at least about three decades ago uh, when he dropped the song Superstition, when you believe in things that you don't understand. The placebo is a perfect example. You hear about it all the time in science, the placebo effect. And the placebo effect translates into, we didn't give you any medicine. We didn't give you anything but sugar water, or we gave you a pill that didn't have anything in it but powder. But we told you in our lab coat and our eyeglasses with our stethoscope hanging around our necks and our microscope on our desk and something that shows you x-ray films in our office and a doctor attached to our name, and we say, take this and you'll be better when you do X, Y, and Z. And you believe it. And when you believe it, the placebo effect has proven to be almost as effective as some medications on a regular basis. I mean, on a regular basis, the placebo. So you believe it. You believe it, it will manifest. As a matter of fact, you can visit a number of these unique churches today where you meet these ministers making big bank and they will say to you, all you have to do is believe. And they, you ask them, what are they preaching? They say they are preaching the gospel of prosperity. And they say, if you believe, if you believe, then you will receive. Placebo affects in a very similar way. Now, let me share something else with you. This is Emoto's work that you're looking at on the right. The effect of water of immune vibration, water. You see before, they were reciting vibrations or words that were very negative. And after they chanted terms that were polite and progressive and positive, the actual matrix of the water changed. Now you can see 500 people to the left sending positive thoughts to bottle water, it changes. A prayer over water changed the water from what you see on the left to what you see on the right. When you hear people of color saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me, they're just repeating a nonsense rhyme because it's nonsense. Words can do more damage to you than a blow. You can say something to someone and they will say to you very clearly, you hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings. People endure more pain than you could imagine today because of being online. We call it cyberbullying. How can someone bully you and yet not touch you? It's what they say about you. It's how they represent you. And so when other people believe those things, you have to spend a lot of time trying to clarify that those things are not true. And invariably, when you get saturated with that energy, you absorb it and you become depressed. And that depression undermines your ability for your brain to function optimally. And when your brain does not function optimally and you're depressed, your body has begun to turn over neurotransmitters that make you lethargic, anhedonic, which means you don't want to move, plus the, lethar the lethargy. And then you add to that you don't want to eat, so you're not getting the amino acids that you need in your body. Your sleep cycle is thrown off balance, and you become depressed. And when you become depressed, I'm going to be very diplomatic about what I say when I start talking to you briefly about anxiolytic and psychotropic drugs. This is what I was telling you a little while ago about what happens with the algorithms. Now, I'm sure 
that you can see, I think it's seven graphics of this particular person here, but you can see now we can represent people and morph them in terms of their gender. We can represent people, morph them in terms of what their persona is, and you only need to upload one picture. And the algorithm can create whatever it is that you ask it to create. A portfolio, are you literally designed with algorithms? Specified outcomes tailored to the culture or themes endorsed by a particular business hallmark signature. I have a picture, but I didn't upload it into these slides. I wish I had uploaded into these slides and I don't want to spend time looking for it. Some of you probably have seen it online. You've seen, if you back up 35 years ago, you may see a brother kneeling in front of a sister, talking to her, trying to get her number or date her or something like that, right? But today you may see a sister in front of a brother on her knees, basically pleading to him to do the things that were stereotypically associated with what men did 30 years ago. What I'm getting at is, is when you see the graphic symbolism, like brothers running around what I call plumber butt syndrome, they have their pants sagging so low, you can see the cleavage at their derriere, all right? Now, what they don't know is a number of people are aware that that was a signature feature of people being incarcerated, but they turned it into a style and they put it online and then people began to, to do it and endorse it and it became a fashion statement. As pathological as it is, it became a fashion statement. Now, when you take this up to a level, you can say this is all positive because you submit one picture and then someone else does the work for you. And when they do the work for you, that curtails your creativity and it also minimizes something called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity in your brain for you to think things through and carve new pathways in your brain because the computer is doing it for you. And when the computer does it for you, it's like I said a little while ago when I was talking to you about not being able to recall over seven people's telephone number in my phone because I had their names attached to it. It's four that I can easily recall, all right? The other three I have to pause to think about to get the digits and get the numbers in order. Because when I want to call them, I pull up the icon or the symbolism or their name, and I no longer have to remember their number. A similar thing is happening with young kids in school today. They don't write anymore, but they use their thumbs on a regular basis. This is a perfect example of what you can find when you're dealing with algorithms. Now, if the computer went online to find all of the data that's associated where you see the red on the left, about a black woman nursing, even as far back as what happened with Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl, all right? You're gonna find language associated with negativity. So when the algorithm searches and find those things about black women's breasts, you may be saturated with a lot of things that relate to negativity. Conversely, if you make a reference to our vanilla sister here, you see the language at the top, the adorable photo of a graduating university student breastfeeding is going viral. There's that word again, going viral. On the left, breastfeeding mom's college graduation photo stirs controversy. Why? Because the journalists that are recording the stories and the narratives that follow thereafter, you may not even know that, journalists may not know that she's actually throwing shade and player hating because of the things that are happening on your planet right now with the fertility among our vanilla brothers and sisters. So they chime into that mindset. It's just like when you see what happened with a number of people in the media, you're gonna find a lot of data on this person of color that was just at Michigan State. And I think three people expired, maybe more. You're gonna find Buku data. But when you look at the data pool that comes in on some of the well-known mass killers or creators of carnage in America. You may get a narrative about they had a rough life or they grew up in an environment. We don't know how they got radicalized. But when you put it in your search engine online, you find those things that make the story more palatable and more tolerable. And search engines literally respond to what the algorithm guides them to. Same thing here. If you were to look at some of these aboriginal people, you see these European counting and measuring? He's measuring this person's nose. He's also measured their cheekbones and how open their eyes are. 
you know, the slant in their eyes. And they use their protocol to measure everything, but they use a Eurocentric tool to measure. And that Eurocentric tool to measure marginalizes melanin dominant people. And you're gonna find the exact same thing when you go online. They use that same protocol to put in place eugenics. And I won't even touch what we're doing today with eugenics because it's gone to a higher level. It's another example of algorithms. Algorithms determine the risk factor. Now you can see Bernard Parker on the right, Dylan Fuget, or Fuget on the left. Okay, and you see, look at the top. I'm Vernon Pratter. I'm, I want to process for you, okay? This person had two armed robberies, happened to be a Caucasian, right? There's someone else at the bottom now that you're not able to see it, but need this other person. You can see at the left, two armed robberies, one attempted armed robbery, subsequent offenses, one grand theft, because that person would be Caucasian, they say low risk, okay? That's what the algorithm would tell you when you're looking. Now you look to the one that's immediate to the right of it, where you see um, prior offenses, four juvenile misdemeanors, subsequent offenses, none, high risk. You see the problem? And on your far right at the screen, you see James Ravelli and you see Robert Cannon, low risk. Look at James Ravelli profile. One domestic violence, aggravated assault, one grand theft, one petty theft, one drug trafficking, subsequent offenses, one grand theft. The person on the right, medium risk, Robert Cannon, prior offense, one petty theft, subsequent offenses, none. Algorithms guide these kinds of profiles to pop up with this labeling. I used to make comments about it would be great when we get RoboCop to police certain cities, but whoever writes the algorithm will determine how aggressively RoboCop is going to engage the community. Now, who will write the algorithm that defines beauty? Who will write the algorithm that defines beauty and what metrics will be utilized? Now, you can see it. Now, even though you see these ladies clustered here together and they sprinkle in a little chocolate, but all these women that you see here, they look damn near anorexic, okay? They are so skinny. They look damn near anorexic. So process it. In commercials and television shows, they show women that are flawless, skinny, and beautiful. You see that red lightning bolt that I attached to the word beautiful? Because even in the advertisement, they are conveying to you that all those other attributes translates into beauty. So when you see the algorithm pulling up beautiful, attractive women, you're gonna find a bunch of crap that's showing you anorexic women, which is gonna tell little young girls that they do not need to have any body flesh. And if they are quote unquote chocolate, they need to have a particular hairstyle and they need to have a particular body type. Algorithms do that. That's why I said to you, we have to start writing these damn algorithms. I put this here just to remind you of what algorithms did to us. I want to be very clear. Who controls the earth? I'm going to share something with you that I usually would not touch. All right. What's in the syringe? And who's connected to that hand? What's in the syringe and who's connected to that hand? Now, you can see this mask around the planet. Three and a half to four years ago, if you guys dressed up and put on a little cute mask and start walking the street or doing anything or went anywhere, 95% probability that policemen or troopers would have pulled you over and asked you what was going on. So I want you to know that the crown virus, that's the most deleterious and deadly virus on your planet, is much more endemic than the SARS virus. It's racism. And racism actually drives over 85 to 92% of all the algorithms that you see online because they're geared toward neuromarketing. Like, what can we sell you that you don't need? Check this out, match.com. You see what they have here? I am a nice girl. Really, I am. Now, I just shared with you a picture uh, with a sister in it, all right? Relationship. Never married, no kids, want kids, definitely, and she's white slash Caucasian. Full figure, Christian slash other, occasionally social drinker. Now, you have software. Remember I was telling you about those apps? 
people use these dating apps and they start trying to find companions on these dating apps. And then when you get to the person, they're not a damn thing like the damn app identified them to be. They show you all kinds of new things that were not actually asked for in that particular dating app because she put in her profile. This is how an algorithm works. She spelled out exactly what she's looking for. So anyone that does not respond to this profile as it is here in terms of what she's looking for, the algorithm will find all those people for her because it's going to dump the ones that don't fit the criteria. I want you to know, the only reason I put these brainwaves here to share with you, that we have the ability to make your brainwaves go where we would like them to go based upon the imagery that you find in the algorithm. Let's say if you like sci-fi movies and you haven't had time to look up the latest sci-fi movies, but you just purchased a pair of shoes or you bought something online at Amazon, but on your television, which is a smart TV, you look at a lot of sci-fi movies. You may find sci-fi movies percolating or dancing around what you were looking at in terms of an advertisement, it'll show up in your phone. And you're like, wow, these sci-fi movies are just popping up here. And it'll tell you where you can find them. And what it will do is it will cause your brain waves, if you're excited looking for what you're looking for, then your brain waves will take a dip and go into alpha. Because whatever you were looking for that had your attention, you will see something that makes you relax just a little because you may like to really look at sci-fi movies. But if you don't spend enough time there, then the algorithm will bring in other sci-fi movies that it has a history of knowing that you like to keep you in that loop. And as you stay in that loop, you will find yourself in that loop about ready to look for sci-fi movies that may not be on your Netflix or be on regular TV, but they may be on Prime. And you may have to purchase them. So you were just walking through a pathway of neuromarketing and you didn't even know we were commandeering your brain, making you plug into what we wanted you to plug into. And we are good at it, very good at it. Neuromarketing has allowed us to unlock your brain. And we unlock your brain with things that we know you like that you don't even want to admit you like. For example, take a guy that claims he's looking at beer ads and um, for the football or some particular like drinks, um, cognacs or something like that online. But suppose they have what they've identified as very attractive women. Um, if you live in an environment where most of the people in that particular environment are binary. So the advertisements are going to be advertisement that relates to quote unquote heterosexual relationships. If you're out in Cali, or are you in a particular place in California where there is a tremendous amount of fluidity and openness for the LBGT community, all right, or in a place in Atlanta, then you may find advertisements that are advertising things specifically with people in those advertisements that are clearly non-binary. So now they have your attention because they know what you like and they're saturating you with those things that you like. And guess what they've just done? They've just unlocked your brain affect. They unlock your emotions. And remember, I told you emotions, people think they have control over their emotions, but martial artists and people that study yogi and Buddhists or study yoga, they become, they become a yogi. They study how to keep their mind relaxed. Back to the term that I showed you at the beginning relating to mantras and people surrounding you, chanting things to you. Before you know it, you start believing what other people are doing. I only put this slide here to let you know that we're already at the state in this society where we're in the process of trying to duplicate a human brain and trying to figure out how to upload it in a computer. And we're only uh, three years away from that, 2023. We're, we're, 2025 is when they say they're gonna have those things ready. And your avatar. I had my students to do many years ago and I left this here to highlight it particularly. There was a movie called Surrogates when people were basically hacked in to their computer and they will have a duplicate of themselves out in the world experiencing all types of things while they just sat back and enjoyed the sensations of what they were doing. You guys do it a lot when you dream. I'm sure some of you had a dream that you thought that really wasn't a dream because you thought you had gotten up to go urinate or tinkle. Then you had to quickly awaken yourself to go and urinate or tinkle. Or you were having a dream that was an intimate dream that you didn't want to wake up from. 
That's how powerful your brain is. That's how powerful your pineal gland is when you go into dream skating. I want you to see this code and these codes to let you know so that you won't think that I'm leaving out the vanilla brothers and sisters. These advertisements are clearly from the 50s and early 60s. And as you can see, check this out. Look, show her it's a man's world. If James Brown didn't make it clear to people, it's a man's world, but it would be nothing without a woman, folk would probably still be embracing that mentality. All right? Look, she's waiting on this man. And you can tell it's a Eurocentric model because he's in bed. He has on a damn Windsor knot and a tie, and he has his arms clasped, his hands clasped behind his head, and this woman is on her knees waiting on him. This is the role they gave to women. And on your right, you see, Christmas morning, she'll be happier with a Hoover when they were advertising Hoover vacuum cleaners. Don't no woman want no damn vacuum cleaner for no Christmas presents. She wants something for herself. But those are the advertisements, and that was navigating printed codes, which program you to be compliant in those roles. Today, those gender roles have shifted dramatically. And because I, well, I, I think I can probably, no, my back is not gonna allow me to make the screen bigger. But you can see those roles broken down. If you look closer at your screen, you will see cooking where women, women have done, do most of the cooking. They do most of the house chores. They do most of the grocery shopping. Um, they typically are engaged in the parent-teacher events with their kids. Those are the kinds of things that women stereotypically did, right? Women in the global workforce, see? Algorithms tell you, and when the algorithm goes in and look, Suppose the lady comes in and she wants a job and the computer's about to assign a job to her. The computer's giving her a job based upon her talents and her skills. The computer's going to look at the database and it's going to look at what the algorithms have said about these people in that particular environment. And the computer is going to recommend that she takes a job that's more compatible with what the computer says that women typically do. That's what the algorithm is going to follow her to. All right? And it's going to explain to her based upon the data sets that it pulls up from its files. I'm going to be through showing slides in about 10 minutes. I want to make sure that you remind me so that we can have comments, um, comments, 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 and if necessary, Q&A. So check this out. This was at Me and Me in Miami in January 2015. I pulled this slide up to share with my students. This is social cognition, automatic thinking via the schemas, thinking via negative templates. These, believe it or not, these are neurocognitive algorithms. And these neurocognitive algorithms, they basically go into the psyche of policemen everywhere. And so you look at the guys in blue, like I had to tell some people, they wanted to know why these black police officers did what they did to the brother, all right? Tyree Nichols. And I'm telling you, the blue or the gray or whatever color they're wearing, the police personnel have a mentality that's wedded to their training. And this particular graphic highlights for you how you can be programmed. Now, can you imagine the cops were caught using photos of black men as live target practice, shooting them in the head? Live target practice. Now, I just told you about neurocognitive imprinting. If you practice on this, when you see a quote unquote melanin dominant human as a suspect, what do you think your body is going to be prone to do? It's going to be prone to do what it's been immersed into doing and perceiving as acceptable. Doesn't matter whether or not your phenotype is chocolate, vanilla, butterscotch. You're going to get that. And they use that to program you. And when you add to that, it's a target silhouette in the middle. And these people become the target. Because your brain creates a pathway to say, this is the target. You don't want to miss the target. You can either shoot for open, uh, what they call mass, the upper torso. But if you want to do a kill, you shoot for the head. Algorithms do that. That's why I said, we need to start writing these algorithms. Now, I brought this slide to your attention to bring two things to your attention. OK, behind it, you can see. Write the code. People were complying in 2020 and 2022. We need to write the code. Now, this is from Nuremberg. United States government didn't chime in to join this until actually about 
30, no, about 45 years later, you can look it up to actually get the date. But I want to be clear, as I highlight Sister Harriet Washington, medical apartheid, I want you to notice the Nuremberg Code that they came up with as a result of what happened to your Jewish brothers and sisters. And this is what they stated. Research participants must voluntarily consent to research participation. Uh, research must be based on sound theory and, pr and prior animal testing. Research must avoid unnecessary physical and mental suffering. No research projects can go forward where serious injury and or death are potential outcomes. And proper environment and protection for participants is necessary. Human subjects must be allowed to discontinue their participation at any time. And scientists must be prepared to terminate the experiment if there is cause to believe the continuation will be harmful or result in injury or death. Are you guys aware? I'm going to give you this as an assignment. Look up the name for the CDC before it was called the CDC. That's the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. The Center for Disease Control had another name. And the reason why they changed the name is because they continued to be ongoing with the Tuskegee study up until the mid 70s. And there was a variation studies that are very similar taking place today in over 40% of all penal institutions where you find a disproportionate number of melanin dominant people. And they incentivize them to participate in these studies by suggesting that they may get some kind of brownie points or a relief in the amount of time served for participating. But I highlighted the Nuremberg Code for you because I wanna punctuate something that's a little awkward for me to punctuate because you guys are recording this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You do remember when we released the vaccines, they told you when you get your vaccine dosage A and B, you'd be good to go. And then after you got dosage A and B, they told you that, hey, you might need a booster. Then they told you after you got your booster, you may need a booster for your booster because you now have a variant of the virus that is not responding to the vaccine. And are you aware, I showed you a word a little while ago, I'm gonna back it up and go to this word just one time to show you something. I passed it, I'll be through it in a second. See that word, psycho, neuro, Humanology, beliefs, thoughts, faith, and trust. I'm not going to call this brother's name out of NIH. But people began to ask a lot of questions like, you told us this, you told us that. When is this thing going to actually do what you said it was going to do? I mentioned that to you to share with you that we violated at least four of the ethical principles in the Nuremberg Code when we told people if you don't get this shot, you cannot work here. Matter of fact, they did it so religiously that doctors were afraid to give people an excuse. And they won't even tell you a number of airline pilots chose to take early retirement. And I have personal colleagues, a number of whom are physicians, they decided that they were going to go into private practice instead of working for some institutions because they said they were not willing to be guinea pigs. The other book generated, and there are two more by Harriet Washington, which you find online. You can see, um, I, I made a reference here. We have no right to trust them. I wanna read something for you. In the 40s and 50s, at least 235 black infants. That, that, that number is incorrect, it's a lot more than that, okay? Anyway, as you move down a little further, they read and they state that um, hospital and Memphis and New York University Hospital irradiated the scalps of 2,500 children. 625 of them were black, claiming to be treating them for ringworm. A medical textbook in wild usage stated that radiation doses and x-rays should be increased for Negro patients. Do you know why? Because of the melanin pigment in their skin, the doctors claim they need to have a higher dose of radiation so that they could get the kind of prints that they needed to get on the film. So I'm basically, I'm done. And I want you to know in a nutshell, and I did this hopefully quickly 
so we could engage in dialogue and commentary because I'm sure there are a number of you in the family that know a lot more about computer code than I have downloaded in this presentation. So note this person here, what have I done? You follow the protocols of your psychopathic peers. And the reason why I refer to these people as psychopathic peers is because you just had in the past two weeks, you shot down three unidentified objects in the sky that you claim were not a real threat because actually they were actually flying at an altitude that over 98% of all commercial airlines don't fly. They usually fly maybe about three and a half, uh, maybe about three miles above the earth. And, and you know, 5,000 and 5,580 feet basically is a mile, okay? Now they're flying like 40,000 feet, all right, 30,000 feet. And you're telling me you shot them down, but they were not a threat. And I guarantee you over the next few weeks, they're gonna tell you three things. We haven't figured out what they were yet. And then they're gonna saturate the story with what happened with the balloon from China to get your attention and fixate on that, to surmise that maybe those things were possible threat. But they still claim they don't know exactly what they were. But they honestly admit to you candidly, um, these things had no system of propulsion. Um, it just seems to be floating on air, all right? I'm done with the presentation. And I wanted to leave plenty of room for us to actually talk and engage and highlight specific things. Thank you for giving me this amount of your time. And this time I made sure that I put together a document that will allow us to have an ample amount of time to engage and dialogue and learn from each other. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Racion, for a truly fascinating, wonderful, and informative presentation. To everyone in the audience, just a reminder to please place your questions for Dr. Racion in the Q&A box. And we will like to go ahead and begin our discussion. Um, so one of the first things, Dr. Racion, if you can speak to, um, you were talking about how the internet impacts us and using the, the web, which is, as you say, is full of tricks. I love that. Can you speak on the impact of social media on in-person human social interactions, particularly the social interactions of our youth? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, let me give you a foundation first. And now you're off video, if you can come back on. Okay, do I have a visual now? Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. The youngsters that are online, and let me be clear, anyone that's younger than 18 years of age online, the last part of your brain to develop are your frontal lobes. And that's the part where you see the birds flying away from here, scattered away, where you see the birds fly. That's your frontal lobes, all right? That's the very last part of the human brain to fully develop. I'll be very clear. It doesn't even begin to reach maturation until people are in their mid to late 20s. And it's viewed as not being fully mature until you right at 30, all right? 28, that's one of the reasons why um, they don't tell you, but like you're not able to run for a presidential office in the US of A unless you're 35 years of age, right? Uh, because you, you have to be clearly over 29 and ideally you have to have that cycle, i.e. that other seven, right? And 28, then you're 35, right? You add a seven to that. But the kids in a nutshell, because this is the last part of their brain to develop and what's happening down beneath the temporal lobes in the brain, the limbic system, their part of the brain is super active because hormones are dancing around and kids are basically getting their brain to define their sense of identity. And so when you see those things online, kids are extremely vulnerable. And they're so vulnerable that whatever is happening online, they absorb because there's a phenomenon in the brain called neuroplasticity, which means that the brain can literally create new pathways and sort of like regrow um, a network of neurons to process new information. And so when you're online and you're sitting there, typically sedentary and or playing video games, you're not moving around a lot. So what you're getting, you're taking in through your optics and audio. Your eyes are taking information in and your ears are taking information in. And because we're talking about social networking, even if you're playing a video game, you have a, a loop that's allowing your thumbs and your fingers to engage. 
but the front part of your brain isn't really online and active. So it's incredibly dangerous for two reasons. Because what kids see happening on a regular basis, they oftentimes wonder if they should duplicate those behaviors because it becomes a dare. And like I shared with you earlier, when it goes viral. So sadly, our kids are vulnerable to everything from suicide to being sexually exploited, experimenting on themselves in isolation, and also not developing appropriate social skills because they can hide behind whatever kind of avatar they've created online and they basically have diminished interpersonal skills. So it's absolutely dangerous. And if the child is younger than 12, it's particularly dangerous. And rather than use the number, if the kid hasn't reached puberty yet, and the reason why I use 12 is because you have girls now between the ages of eight and 10 having an early menstrual cycle, but that's related to food, diet, and some things that you see online, but it's more specifically related to food and diet and the hormones that they inject into the animals. So it's dangerous. It's even dangerous for adults because people don't know how to interact with each other. The conversation would be, well, I saw you online. You look so nice. I did that. I did this. Oh, I also do this. But what about your spirit? What's happening with your chakras? So you don't get a chance to read the person's energy if you rely on what's online. Okay. Following up on that, you had a slide that looked at brain waves. Can you connect for us the programming that occurs with, well, videos that go viral, we can even say TV and programming, um, how it impacts our subconscious and how we're programmed through that. And then how could we even utilize this information for, let's say children in, in, in a learning environment? I know you're a professor, so we're talking about academic learning. How, how can we, flip this and use it positively to help students um, learn more efficiently? It's another excellent question. Um, the only reason I'm gonna say it's a little challenging, but it can be done. And the reason why I say it can be challenging is because unfortunately in academia, um, academia has a tendency to seek out funding from organizations that have their own objective built into why they are funding you, okay? And so they have an objective to fund things that's either going to enhance and make their project or product more marketable. And whether we like it or not, we don't value children in this society, okay? We do not value our children. Um, we have people now allowing the technology to raise their children. They'll park them in front of a video console, give them a small digital device. So what we can do is we can become more aggressive. I'm talking about the community and demand and advocate for people in academic environments to have more access to funding to do things that have a, a stronger educational thread. And the way you do that is ironically like Vanilla Brothers and Sisters do all the time. They write letters. Brown and black people have a tendency, particularly black people, to go to an event and get hyped up and excited at the event and talk about all the things that are going on, but they won't write anything down. Or they won't say, I know this person at Duke University or uh, uh, my boy up at um, Carl up at Columbia who does a lot of research on drugs. And we want him to do some research uh, what happens inside of the brain of little children that play video games all the time. And, but they say, we don't have any funding for that. We have Buku funding for research and pharmaceuticals. So, but if you live in that community, you're in that environment, one letter translates into the views of about a hundred people in academia, because you took the time to write it down and they will say somebody's thinking about it. So you have to speak up. And when you're in schools, you have to demand, you have to say, well, and I'm not trying to say anything about myself, but I'm talking about people that you may know, right? That are nurturing, concrete example. Academia, the vast majority of things that happen in academia revolve around, did you get published in a peer reviewed journal? How much money did you bring into the university? Are people recognizing your research among your peers? And I try to tell people every time I have an opportunity, if you are an African or melanin dominant neuroscientist, you don't have any peers unless you are doing research with rats in the laboratory, 
research for pharmaceutical companies or research that deals with some kind of military application, something that relates to helping um, people that were no longer ambulatory learning how to deal with their prosthesis. They have money for that, but they don't have money to help you educate kids in the city because they don't give a damn about them. So it behoove people in churches to say, invite this person to come and speak or call a meeting at the school and ask the school, what have you put in place to incorporate utilizing video games of a certain class of video games that have less violence in them, video games that are going to foster what we call neuroplasticity, you know, uh, video games that will allow a kid to understand like the ones that you can put on your face um, and you can actually navigate a variety of platforms with learning how to do things. So you have to speak up. You literally have to speak up. The other thing that I would simultaneously do to help kids is I would make sure that any academic environment that I'm in, that the youngsters all have access, all of them have access to what you would call a free lunch, but a healthy lunch, okay? And they wouldn't literally just have to say, we're going to eat this on that day or that day. They may have a minimum of two, ideally three choices to choose from when they are getting their lunch and they don't have to pay a penny or a dime for it because we are the dumbest people on the planet when it comes to science, technology, and engineering. And it's not because the kids are not bright. It's because the people that are often in place to deliver that information, they do not know how to relate to our children. They do not value our children. And oftentimes, sadly, some of them claim that they are afraid of our children. And that's because they don't know how to relate to them. Awesome, thank you. Neo asks, what steps should we take to position ourselves and prepare our children to learn to begin to write our own algorithms? Actually, that's another awesome, great question. You should be able to impose upon your children this train of thought. Okay, if you really want that particular video game, I want you to go online and I want you to put in a search engine like children and algorithms. See what you can find. And I want you to know what they are. Because you give it to them early, and I mean early before they reach the age of 10. Some people say before they reach the age of seven. Brother, they will be writing algorithms. Sister, they will be writing algorithms to blow your mind. Because remember, the algorithm is a recipe. But in order to write the recipe, you need to know what ingredients you have to work with. And when you immerse them in the information, their brain will automatically calibrate to retrieve and reinvent that information. And they will become good at it. And they will basically be creating algorithms in their youth. So we need to expose them. And the way you do that is, if you're going to look at X amount of programming on television that's basically, from your point of view as an adult, might be nonsense or just random video games, tell them, OK, for every hour you spend doing that online, I need you to give me 15 minutes of something that relates to how that was developed. OK, what's involved in creating that? And kids will be incentivized to do that and simultaneously make available to them good food, good drinking water, and do not allow them to have a period of engaging in that technology that would exceed any more than about 50 minutes in a setting. Break them away from that setting after they peaked about 50 minutes in that setting. Okay. And I'm not, I'm trying to give you this number not arbitrarily, I'm talking about attention and saturation and also the opportunity to say you've done that enough, right? Because kids will immerse themselves in that technology and they'll stay there for hours and then find themselves crunched trying to do their schoolwork and find themselves crunched in terms of trying to do their homework. The other thing I would do, if they have siblings, I would make sure they interact with their siblings. Let me say this to you. About, say maybe 15 years ago, um, the mother of my children and I, we purchased a vehicle and it had dual headrests in the back of the vehicle for the kids to look at what they wanted to look at on video. But I realized that you could sync it so one headrest would show video A and one headrest would show video B. So I basically got someone to disconnect that. So whatever you saw on one headrest, you saw on the other headrest. So that they could see the same thing so they could interact. And I said that to you to say, if you've ever flown on a plane on an international flight, you know, you can see a number of movies and everybody have on the back of their seat in front of them, 
a, a, a miniature screen so they can see what they want. So what's happening with our children is they go into their own individual world. And when they go into their own individual world, the interpersonal skills dwarf. And parents need to stop using technology to babysit their children. Thank you. Dominique uh, asked, given this algor algorithmic wave you graciously highlighted, digital presence has become an imperative, especially as an entrepreneur slash creative. What are some practical solutions you recommend to be connected but disconnected or mitigate from the neuroplasticity effects? You might repeat that question again because it has about three questions in it. So I just want you to read it again so I can pull out the pieces that I'm going to answer in order. So sure. What are some practical solutions you recommend to be, well, let me, I'll read the whole thing. Given this algorithmic wave you graciously highlighted, digital presence has become an imperative, especially as an entrepreneur slash creative. What are some practical solutions you recommend to be connected but disconnected or mitigate from the neuroplasticity effects? Okay, that's an excellent question and it's actually loaded. Um, first of all, your brain is going to change directly related to habits that you engage, period, okay? So ironically, you the level of disengagement will be when you leave the platform, number one. And the way you leave the platform is you literally disengage from engaging in that device and something as simple and as old fashioned as, um, I'll just say it, like if you were to go outside and toss a football or a soccer ball back and forth to a, a child or a sibling and interact with him or her, and if you were to go out and interact with them and um, even ask them while you engage in some kind of movement activity, you need to get them away from that, okay? Because it's kind of like you're static, you're sitting there. So to disengage them, you need to get them away from that. It's almost like if you know they have a particular um, treat that they like. You can say, okay, you spend 45 minutes now. You have about five minutes left. So we're going to go and get X, Y, Z, and we're going to chill out for a little while. And um, um, moms or dads going to make you listen to some old school. And I want you to pull the theme out of that song or the lyrics or something like that. Or I want you to listen to some music and not some rap music. So you're going to engage another sensory modality, right? For example, it may be just audio and less visual and less um, um, fine motor dexterity with your fingers and your thumbs and literally fixating on your eyes. So you're gonna have a movement activity, right? And that engages another part of the brain. Now, in terms of actually um, creating algorithms that are relevant, wherever you're working and whatever you're doing, you need to be assertive enough to tell the people that you're working on, this particular algorithm can have um, one or two tiers built into it. And those tiers can be um, they can sandwich their primary objective, but if they want, they want you to purchase certain things, then around that particular thing they want you to purchase, they may have some exercise activity with that product, okay? For example, rather than advertising a pair of sneakers to you saying you're gonna be like uh, LeBron or Michael Jordan, you follow me? Uh, they advertise and say to you, if you do this particular exercise and in these particular sneakers, it'll minimize your body developing a excess body mass and you have a lot more energy to engage in your exam. You'll be more alert and you won't fall asleep as quickly when you're doing stuff that's boring to you. So you have to mix it up because the human brain engages everything that's happening that your body does. But if you only do one thing routine, then the neuroplasticity effect, it's almost like walking across someone's lawn every day the same way. So you're going to create a path in that grass and you're going to debraid or break up that grass creating that path and the person would think that when they see that path that's the way they're supposed to go and thinking that's the way they're supposed to go then they will not explore other alternative routes to get from point a to point b you literally can become what we call having a one-track mind when you do the same thing over and over again and you meet people we call those things habits right and habitual engagement can literally cause the brain to become for lack of a better term myopic and, and one-sided Thank you. Terry says, yikes. How compromised are our adult brains that have been COVID-19 vaccinated and boosted and all these years of computer use? 
Uh, that's a question to make you find me on the freeway in about two weeks and somebody said, we didn't know Dr. Rossian did drugs or Dr. Rossian was driving 105 miles per hour on 495 or, 390, or 295. I'll diplomatically respond to that particular answer by giving you references that you can use on your own. Um, you can go to a website that's actually recognized by the government. I'm going to give you the letters. It's called V as in vanilla, A as in apple, E as in energy, R as in rapid, V-A-E-R-S, virus. You go there and you will find a lot of data that's well documented that directly relates to that question slash comment that you raised. Another place you can go um, is a psychiatrist. He's a Harvard graduate. He's written several books. His name is Dr. Peter Briggen, and that's B-R-E-G-G-E-N, I believe. It might be an I. B-R-E-G-G-E-N, Dr. Peter Briggen. He's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. And if you put his name in your search engine, it'll probably take you to his website, okay? And Peter has at least about six books written. And he also has comprehensive links that directly relate to the question that you just asked and the question that you raised. So when I made a reference for you to go to V as in vanilla, A as in apple, E as in energy, R as in rapid, and S as in Sam, virus, you will find buku data there that I am disinclined to expand on in this forum. Now, in terms of the brain fog, I will respond to the brain fog from this point of view. Being closed in, in your home, if you don't have adequate ventilation, um, you know, have your windows open from time to time. If your flat or so your home is hermetically sealed and you don't have plants in your flat, a number of plants in your home, then you basically are saturating your body and your brain with what we call negative ions. And negative ions foster the turnover of free radicals. And free radicals, by their very nature, give you brain damage. And if you don't have an idea of what they are, think about the old video games, Pac-Man. But think, think about Pac-Man having on um, uh, a jagged edge shoot suit with shards of glass in the garment. And every time it runs around, it tears, it screws up something. That's why free radicals create cellular damage in your body, okay? Now, if in fact you really want to mitigate at a meaningful level of what happened from being closed in your flat, your home for that extended period of time, you need to be either up in the morning so that you can get the negative ions in the air. If you live in a city, you got to be a little bit more discreet. You have to go where there's a lot of foliage. And just lean over about 30 degrees, 45 degrees may make you faint. And take a few deep breaths, okay, in the morning, you know, when you have mist or dew in the air, and that will give your body sort of like a, a surge of free radicals and your deep breathe, all right? And that will give your brain sort of like a recharge. The other thing is you probably can consume um, more foods that are uh, Feel with antioxidants. And if you're going to put vitamin C in your diet, I would suggest that you use a calcium ascorbate or just don't use ascorbic acid, okay? Ascorbic acid is like the most adulterated version of vitamin C that you can get. I'm talking about how to deal with the brain fog and renew your brain. Now, I can share with you some of the sequelae that's associated with what happened to people that wound up with, with um, the SARS virus. Um, there's a phenomenon, if you go online and Google it, you'll see it. They'll refer to it as a C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. It's called a cytokine. And cytokines are like little proteins that you actually need. But what happens if, in fact, you wound up with the bug or if you wound up with a serious side effect from an inoculation, a serious side effect, um, you would have... Um, a variation of a cytokine storm. And if you don't know what that means, I'm gonna give you a metaphor for it. I don't know where you live, but in the District of Columbia, we have park police, um, who also known as Capitol Police, and we have the, um, the, the, the district police or the policemen for the District of Columbia. And you also have Secret Service Police, and you also have some people affiliated with the FBI. So imagine all these police personnel coming together, but they don't really like to talk to each other to share information. And so because they don't like to talk to each other and share information, you're going to have a little bit of confusion and chaos. So when you have a cytokine storm, the cells that will show up in your body to figure out what's wrong, they run into each other. They don't communicate in a rhythmic manner. 
So you have chaos. Whenever you have chaos at a cellular level, you're going to have what we call um, inflammation. And inflammation creates what we call a cytokine storm. And inflammation creates swelling because histamine is showing up in there to try to figure out what's swelling up. But the cells that are trying to figure out why the histamine showed up, they would be debating among themselves, like, does histamine really need to be here? Then you're going to have a cortisol surge, right? And when you have all of that, your heart rate's going to change, okay? Your level of excitation is going to go up and down. And unfortunately, you may find yourself dealing with a, a slow dance or an intermittent dance called arrhythmia. Your heart may begin to beat erratically. And they will tell you, sometimes they made it clear. Um, some people wound up with irregular heartbeats. They wound up with a number of cardiovascular events that were juxtaposed as a side effect associated with being inoculated. And that's the best I can do for you. Awesome. Lowell asks, does AI systems have the ability over time to rewrite its own language? And will AI dominate the human race? Damn, that's an awesome question. First of all, um, you may not realize this. <laughs> AI has almost already dominated the collective body of people on the planet called humans, all right? AI has pretty much um, has already done that. And AI does have the ability. As a, uh, it's a special of high-end coding. It's a specific term for it. Um, that I honestly don't have in my memory that I can pull up for you. Um, but there is a high end level of AI and it is able to write its code. As a matter of fact, if you play a chess game on a regular basis and if you put that chess engine on something in particular, you can get that chess engine to begin to play you according to how you play, okay? And as you know, there are a number of video games that you can play and the video game can learn and it can learn how you play. All right. And that's old school. So clearly we have the technology that can do those things that, that you just mentioned. And as a matter of fact, Elon Musk is trying to get, let me see, do I have a slide? He's trying to get permission to, um, I'm not sure where it is. I have to go in this direction and find it. He's trying to get permission to actually address, you ever heard of a, a group of people called the Borg and Star Trek? Uh, they, they, they pretty much share the same thoughts. They're like a colony of ants or a hive of bees. Um, we're now working on technology to allow humans to um, basically ask for something by not asking based upon the volume of use. Like you can get a smart refrigerator. A refrigerator can tell you. It can say, Alexa's order, blah, blah, blah you know, um, blah, blah, blah is getting low in the refrigerator, okay? Um, your television can tell you when you're home and you're sitting down chilling and you could be looking at a program and once that program goes off, the television could stream in front of you on a banner. Um, these programs fit your taste, you follow me? So yes, AI can learn, AI is already learning. As a matter of fact, some kids in college have begun to solicit AI programs to write their papers for them, okay? And a number of professors they haven't figured out yet how to differentiate between what the student has written and what they've actually gotten offline because you can't go online and do a search for this paper because it's just written specifically related to that subject matter. They're working on now how to, to capture that. But I don't think AI is going to take over the collective body of humans, um, at least not within the next decade. Okay. At least I would say um, by 2033, I think you're good to go. So following up on that question, can you speak to um, earlier, you were talking about ones and zeros, yin and yang um, being needed to create. Can you talk about the movement towards transhumanism and you mentioned Elon Musk and these ideas of neural links and putting chips in the brain. What are your thoughts around that and its implications for Black people? You guys are so brilliant. You're asking me the kinds of questions that I'm not going to tiptoe around answering. We're already experimenting with transhumanism. 
as a matter of fact, there is a lot of literature that's being generated now about how we're trying to marry um, um, carbon um, to silicon. We're trying to figure out how to do that. And there is some special technology that goes beneath the rubric of nanofabrication. Nanofabrication is when you're getting something that's super, super tiny. And if you don't have nano in your vocabulary, just think about what the Dravidian brothers and sisters of the people of Kush used to call deep meditation. They talked about prana. And the, the, the suffix in the word prana, N-A, is the prefix in the word nano, nanotechnology. It means smaller than a molecule. You're talking about things damn near at the atomic level. And um, there have been some debates about some of the new variants of inoculations uh, being married to nanotechnology. And it has to be tiny anyway if they're going to start talking about something talking to your um, genetic material in your body and your messenger um, DNA, your genetic material uh, messenger RNA. So we already have that kind of technology in place. Now, I'm trying to, what was the last part of your question? Because I want to make sure I don't go off on a tangent anymore and I'm probably already about to. Oh no! Just we were um, just asking about the transhumanism and okay, got you. the I got neural you. links. Okay, yes, we writing. are definitely we are de we're doing that. We're working on that now. It's actually being, for example, let me give you an example. We did something similar to this at least two decades ago when they talked about people having to fly these um, incredibly fast jets, and they talked about the person's helmet. You thinking, and you put the helmet on, and how you would think then the craft will respond to how you're thinking. And so with nanotechnology and people being able to sync with something in your brain that relates to the pulses of the electromagnetic waves of your brain, which are basically like a, a miniature um, surge of an electrical current that's related to brainwave activity uh, that's coming actually from your scalp. So the way you think actually creates a pulse of electromagnetism. That's why you, your grandparents would say to you, boy, what you thinking about? You're thinking real hard over there in that corner and you're just sitting there, but they can pick it up. So what we are now working on is how to hijack your thinking by putting something else in your head. And transhumanism is literally related to that because transhumanism means we are trying to marry a form of nano synthetic intelligence to organic carbon intelligence. But the objective is to, to create an interface so whenever you want to know something, you could be proximal to a server or near a satellite and you can download that information almost the same way if you put two phones near each other, you can share playlists. You know, you put and you can do this without actually being online, right? Uh, because we can identify um, a number of things from satellites um, within a eight to 10 meteor um, square radius, right? So given that your body runs by electricity, we can actually commandeer what's happening inside of your body. If we change the, the neural network in your body by tagging um, your neuronal network with microscopic or nanoparticle size, um, little things that are floating around in your body. And we're already doing this anyway, okay? We're, we're, we're doing it now, all right? And I'm, I'm not unclear about what I want to say. I'm trying to figure out how to say it to minimize some fundamental pushback that I may get for saying it. But we're already there. We're already manipulating how humans think. One of the ways that we do it in particular with brown and black people is we do it with music, okay? Because we're very, very responsive to music. And that's why you, you, music tracks are usually oftentimes as memorable as the content of a movie. And so transhumanism translates into making you hypersensitive to whatever we put in your body when you're giving a charge in a certain environment. And that charge could be everything from a cell phone tower could be nearby, okay? Um, we could actually impact your thinking in an adverse manner if you're one of those humans that's not wise enough to um, not put their phone on speakerphone or use some peripheral um, connections, earbuds when they're on the phone. If you're one of those people that actually puts your cell phone next to your head while you have an extended conversation, then that erratic pulse of electromagnetism coming from that phone 
not only will your phone heat up like hell, it's actually doing brain damage to you. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of people that I, I could have brought slides to highlight this for you to let you know who's, who's done this kind of research. But check this out. The people that have actually done that kind of research, they've either had to go over to um, the UK, to Oxford, or go down under to Australia, or they had to go to France to actually do their presentations on this subject matter. So following up on that, um, I'm going to combine a thought with another question. Um, one of your uh, first slides, your earlier slides was around like this progression of ways to interact with the universe from IFA to uh, astrology to now computer software. And um, one could, could say that, you know, it's like a progression of spirituality that has become more technological. So a, a, an attendee asked, first I said, thank you for your, a great presentation. The Tuskegee Airmen were mentioned in relation to this Hop Gun movie. Would you go into detail of why our black ancestors and elders were the only ones who could perform the dynamic aerials that no others could perform? That's a deep question. Let me see. I hope I have a. I don't think I have a slide here. I, I could go out and pull one up, but I'll have to stop sharing. And my this screen. will be our second to last. We got this one and then one more question. Okay, so let me share this with you. The bottom yeah. line is what the person is relating to. There's, there's three fundamental classes of melanin that are real. There's a fourth class that vanilla people are creating called synthetic melanin. All right, but the three classes that are real are called neuromelanin. All right, and fail melanin and eumelanin. Eumelanin you find in brown and black people. Fail melanin you find typically in people that have blue eyes, blonde hair, very fair skin. They sunburn very easily. But everybody has neuromelanin, except there are compromises in the amount of neuromelanin in the retina in the eyes of albino. And as you know, vanilla people are basically, if you, if you evoke Dr. Wilson and keep it real, they basically present a form of albinism. So the neuromelanin in your body is something called proprioceptors in your body. You know, the kind of stuff that Michael Jordan used to do. You feel the Magic Jordan used to do. I mean, uh, Magic Johnson used to do when they played ball. And they would do these things in the air because proprioceptors, they sort of like lined up. They're like little special connections to your musculature on your skeletal muscles. And they talk to your brain at light speed, okay? I mean, they talk to your brain at light speed. Neuromelanin actually is throughout the nuclei in your brain that allow you to do everything from like um, be able to inhale, exhale, have a heart rate, smell, touch, all your effectors, i.e. all your senses are directly related to neuromelanin, okay? So the reason why that those pilots and those people could do the kinds of things that they did is because think about neuromelanin as being, um, and melanin in general on your skin combined, neuromelanin and melanin on your skin, particularly if you have eumelanin. Think about it as being like uh, a fiber optic cable. You know how you can send digital signals through your fiber optic cable um, for your Verizon um, and, and the cables that you have to actually communicate, which means the signal is bouncing off that little glass wall. Analog is the kind of thing that you would have several people on, but you would get chatter, like they used to have phone lines and you, they will call it a party line, okay? So neuromelanin allows you to do things at the speed of thought. It's almost like you meet someone and they'll say, I knew you were gonna do that before you did it. You feel what I'm saying? And black people, we call it feeling you. So it's related to resonance. And if you were to talk to um, some of these, well, it's only a few couple left now, they would tell you that they become one with the plane, you know? And that the plane will become like an extension of them. And that was one of the reasons why the samurai were feared because people were known to become one with their blade. And the US military tried to borrow that crap by saying, you know, your rifle is your companion, your rifle is your girlfriend, and all this blah, blah, blah. But that's a ballistic weapon. So neuromelanin allows you to actually interface with whatever it is you're using because your brain and your vestibular system is communicating at light speed and there's a synchrony. And that synchrony translates into your body becoming like a gyroscope. So you know when you're upside down, you know when you're right side up, you follow me? You automatically, you know that because your brain is fully functional and the, the neuromelanin allows you to do that, you feel me? And so that's one of the reasons, it's not even a hypothetical reason. 
That is one of the reasons why they were able to do some of the kinds of things that they've done. Now, you can train an isolated group of people to do that, but they would have to be trained from birth. You feel me? So that their brain would develop those, what I would call healthy neuronal networks to do those kinds of things. So those brothers did some things that were basically inhuman. Remember, they were also given a secondary quality of aircraft, and they were doing the things that the other guys were not able to do with the new P class of planes that they developed. That's why. Awesome. So we are at our time. And um, I want to first, uh, of course, thank you for coming out and providing this wonderful uh, presentation. There are some additional questions. Sorry, we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Um, I am going to ask one final question as a way for you to close out. But um, I do want to invite everyone back out to our next Wisdom Wednesday presentation, which will take place on Wednesday, March 15th. And it will feature IKG member, Dr. Quayle Zukiri Porzel. And he'll be speaking on what happens when youth engage with their African heritage, assessing the insight gained from the study of an African-centered high school program led by Tony Browder. So we were talking about social media's impact on the youth. And next month, we will continue um, going into more detail about how to engage our youth with that program featuring, again, Dr. Quayley Porzel. Um, Dr. Racion, the final question for tonight comes from Brother Michael. He, and this I think is a great way to kind of wrap up and leave us with a great final thought. He says, given what you have shared, what would you recommend for us to adjust first today in our lifestyle? That's an excellent question. Um, what the reality is, brown and black people have forgotten how to eat. And if you need a reminder of how to eat, I just want you to know that less than 15% of your teeth are designed, I'll round it off and say 20% of your teeth are designed to tear and cut, all right? Your teeth in front of your incisors and your canine teeth. Most of your teeth are designed to like grind things and really just kind of like grind and chew things up, which means that you need to cut back on eating foods that have parents. And I'm not saying you have to become a vegan or anything like that, but you need to cut back on that because your food provides the micronutrients that your brain needs in order for it to thrive and grow. It also allows your brain to basically be more resilient on the spectrum of neuroplasticity. The other thing that you need to do is you need to, if you have a job that demands that you spend the vast majority of your time interfacing with a computer, you need to get out and move around a little bit. You need to move around. You need to do something that involves movement. And the other thing that you need to do is you need to start talking to people. I don't mean texting people, I mean talking to people. Because talking requires thinking before you verbalize what you're saying. And it engages a totally different part of your brain than writing things down, I mean, than texting things. Some people think that it's, it's an overlap. There is a parallel network, but the overlap is diminished dramatically when you're actually texting versus writing or speaking to someone. Because when you text, it's literally digital. It's, you know, it's your fingers, you hit the key, you see the letter. But if you're writing, you have to engage the actual cursive, the delivery of what you're putting together. Another part of your brain is involved. So your food, the water that you put in your body, certainly should not be coming out of the faucet, okay? Um, the food, the water, and you need to interact more with people. You need to engage, and you don't need to be bashful about it. And I also wanted to point out, because they may not have gotten it, uh, my email address is, um, like a ton, but it's atons, A-T-O-N-S-D-N-A at gmail.com. That's like genetic material, DNA. Atons, like plural. A-T-O-N-S-D-N-A at gmail.com. So if there are a few people that had a comment or a question, you give me about 48 hours, I will give you a, a, a comprehensive answer to whatever you may raise and, I, and or suggest that you go to a particular place to find the answer because I'm not suggesting that I know the answers. And um, I wish I knew how people really felt about this presentation because I think I only um, breached about 
of what I wanted to incorporate into this presentation. Um, but that's because I'm kind of nitpicky. Um, so that's what I would remind you. Oh, by the way, keep your physical vessel clean. And the way you keep your physical vessel clean is you inhale deeply whenever you're around fresh air. You minimize staying closed in. And guess what you have to do religiously? Do not procrastinate answering nature's calls. Because when you skip and avoid answering nature's calls, be you needing a 45 degree angle to answer nature's calls, or you can do it on a 180 to 170 degree angle to answer nature's calls, your body becomes more acidic when you do not hydrate properly and when you do not free your body of excessive compounds in your body that you should get rid of. It will change the pH balance of your blood. And check this out. If you're not answering nature's calls on a regular basis and consuming a balanced diet, you're giving yourself brain damage. Well, thank you. On that note, on that note, um, we will conclude our presentation. So uh, that reminder, as we were talking about AI, artificial intelligence, the solution is to get back into reality uh, intelligence or divine intelligence, DI, getting back in tune with nature um, as, as the ultimate solution in terms of lifestyle changes. So thank Can you. Can I say one thing? Yeah, please. Do. One thing, you just said the word nature. Mm -hmm. um, um, Tony used to make it clear to people back in the day when he was teaching people about the meta netter mm -hmm. and the so-called hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. There is a, a there is a netter. Uh, it's almost like a generic netter. It looks like a little staff with a little flag on it, sort of like a little hatchet, if you will. That netter, N-T-R, net, that represents nature, what you just said. Because the ancient commissions, they may not have the vowel, the U, and the E, all right? Mm -hmm. The A, the netta. And those particular netters represent the attributes of the manifestation of God, goddess qualities mm -hmm. manifest. So when you say get back to nature, you've heard expression before, don't mess with mother nature. Yeah. And that's what's happening when people ignore their nature, they're mm -hmm. making themselves sick. And that's why Europeans use the term called dis-ease because when you screw with nature, you throw things out of balance. And when things are out of balance, you don't have homeostasis and you're inviting disease into your body. I just wanted to share that with you. Absolutely. And you know, the, the picture that you showed of the water, I think represents that because the beautiful crystals, you saw balance, you saw order on that right side, whereas the left side that had that negative energy, mm -hmm. it looked very chaotic. So uh, thank you for, again, um, for explaining that and touching upon that. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, everyone in the audience, you know, please do share your thoughts with Dr. Resion. Some wonderful comments coming in. Again, he did share his email, A-T-O-N-S-D-N-A at gmail.com. And you can email him for, you know, if you have any additional questions. Um, Baba, how can people get your book? Actually, the one about the president is always sold out. I think somebody just buying it, keeping me from selling it to people. <laughs> um, you can go to my website. But if you're local, um, if you're local, like around the DMV, like around Maryland and Virginia, I can make you have it accessible to you very easily without having to pay shipping charges and that kind of stuff. Because the post office has been kind of flaky lately in terms of delivering things on time. You feel me? Okay. Um, and if they are not local, they can go to the website. They can also shoot me a special email to let me know that they ordered the book and I hook them up. Reality Check is online. By the way, even and what's though it the website? It's um, E Y E S O F M A A T dot com. Eyes of Maat dot com. E Y E S O F M A A T dot com. Right? Okay. And you can find. Um, Reality check there. And that's a really comprehensive book. And to be frank with you, every time I read that book, I remember when I first gave it to Black people, it wasn't like really edited the way I wanted it to edit. But like right now, it's the last version of it. So check this out. You know, when I read that book, I sometimes I'll sit back and say, excuse the curse word. I said, yeah, you know, damn well, you didn't write this. <laughs> I know the ancestors. Mm -hmm. That book has stuff in it about AI. It's talking about smart highways and smart cars. 
And I dropped that book before we had smart highways and smart cars. You follow me? You know how the car can read the highway and stuff like that, lane change and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it has buccal information in it about nutrition. It's basically a manual. That's why it's called Reality Check, a manual for the human octahedron and the mystery of melanin. You know, you say that it reminds me of, uh, it made me think of these uh, smart cities that they're attempting to create these 15 minute cities, mm-hmm. which I'm sure is another topic that we can go on about. But um, absolutely, absolutely. And for everyone that asks, A copy of this recording will be on IKG's YouTube page. Give us a couple of days to upload it, but you can go to our IKG YouTube page to uh, see this presentation. And with that, we're going to say thank you for coming out and we will see you next month. I'm honored. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. I hope I did justice to what you guys want me to talk about. Oh, absolutely.